this is Doug Altebeff, Chairman of the Board of Imtir 2, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to another segment of our Zionist Salon. Uh, I'm also pleased to point out that the Salon has been running a series of segments in both Hebrew and in English, and we're gearing up to start a track in French as well. Today, I'm very, very excited to welcome uh, a man of extraordinary scope, interests and accomplishment, and uh, to mangle the metaphor, uh, Michael Oren is one of Israel's true Zionist Renaissance men. And uh, his biography reads a little bit like a wish list many of us would have liked to have compiled for ourselves, an acclaimed author, athlete, politician, of course, Israel's ambassador to the United States from 2009 to 2013. Michael, welcome. Wow, Renaissance man. Makes, ah. me, sound like I, makes me sound like I shower once a year. Thank you, <laughs> Michael, uh, you might recall that our paths crossed many years ago when you were a fellow then the Shalem Institute. Uh, and since then, you went on to Washington, and I and my family made Aliyah. So we've been we've been busy guys. Um, I read the riveting Six Days of War, which I would say is the definitive account of the Six Day War when it first came out, and I was thoroughly, thoroughly intrigued by power, faith, and fantasy. For those of you who don't know, power, faith, and fantasy is a tremendous exploration of the long-time American fascination with the Middle East uh, from the point of view of political involvement, religious interest, and then uh, the romantic allure that uh, the Middle East and this region has had on the American imagination for over two centuries. And it's a, it, it, it's a tremendous book um, and one that has, I think, inspired many other uh, takes on the longtime uh, American sans Jewish, but the American interest in Israel and in the Middle East. Uh, both of these books were bestsellers. Both of them deservedly earned Michael the reputation as a first grade. And given that orientation, his third nonfiction, and yes, folks, Michael is a published novelist and short story writer, and he's going to shamelessly plug his most <laughs> recent novel for us sometime during this interview. Uh, his third uh, nonfiction book, Ally, is a not a history book. Okay? It's a real-time, how it happened, I was there book. Michael, Ally, to me, is fascinating, Dafka, because, I mean, precisely because it is a real-time book written by a historian. That's not something that you see very often. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, it's only been 10 years or so since your service. Uh, historians like to have a lot more of a hiatus for perspective. But the important thing is that we're living in a period of U.S. Israeli relationships that seems in many respects like a deja vu of your own text. And again, it's not 40 years, but I was wondering as I was reading the book, how do you look at all of this? Looking back, how does it look today through the prism of your own direct experience? Mm. Well, thank you, Doug. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. You know, I don't want to quote myself, I'm loathe to quote myself, but there's one line at the end of Ally, which I, um, which I stand behind to this day, and that, that history is very humbling because it reduces the the events that we see as mountainous to, to molehills. And uh, I mean, some of the things that, that I went through you know, 10 years ago, uh, the Mavi Marmara affair, uh, for yeah. example, uh, different clashes with Gaza, which are hardly me mentioned anymore today, um, right. at the time seemed momentous and at the time seemed, seemed, you know, seemed transformative, today much less so. Um, I look back now with a sense of sadness. Um, I'm not sure if I can even write that book today. Um, the America has become so deeply polarized um, and particularly relationships even with Israel and, and much of the American Jewish community. Um, that book, Strange Enough, which was sort of hailed by the by conservatives on the right, was actually written as a book for the left. 
Uh, it was a book, it was like my, my, my attempt to explain Israel to liberal American Jewry. Uh, but even then, most of liberal American Jewry wasn't, wasn't really, really ready to listen. I look back with sadness because at the time, I, I basically got this position uh, as America's, as Israel's ambassador to the United States, because uh, the then Prime Minister Netanyahu had read Power, Faith, and Fantasy. Um, I, I was not in politics at the time. I later came back from Washington and became a member of Knesset and a member of the government. Before that, I hadn't been. I was even a member of the Likud. Uh, right. But uh, Netanyahu was a great fan of history. He's a great historian himself. And he, he needed, felt he needed... And the son of a great young. historian. It's and the son of a great historian. Indeed. Um, and um, he felt he needed somebody who understood America at that time when Barack Obama was coming into office and it was going to, he understood it was going to be a pivotal and potentially dangerous time. Um, and so uh, I had just finished that Power, Faith and Fantasy where, as you mentioned, I, I divided America's 240 year involvement in the Middle East between uh, power, strategy, strategic interests, economic interests, faith, which was mostly started off as Christian faith, later became democratic faith, truly a faith. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and fantasy, as you said, the romantic notions. Um, the Obama period was the last period where America was willing to exert significant power in the Middle East. Uh, American forces were already deeply involved in Iraq, Syria against ISIS, um, in Afghanistan, and later uh, Libya. Um, so America was still engaged in force and projecting force. Today, 10 years later, uh, I'm hard pressed to a to describe a scenario in which America would project even small force, even, even, even limited force uh, around the world, um, almost on any circumstances, almost on any circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd be actually hard pressed to write that book today, Power, Faith, and Fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. that, that continuum has been mm -hmm. broken. Um, and that's a very significant development. The, and, and Israel has an interest, and it doesn't matter right wing, left wing, up or down, Israel has an interest in a strong America that it believes in itself it is willing to project power. I used to even go further, Doug, and say that it was in Israel's interest to have a president who was critical of us, and uh, but willing to use power, uh, mm -hmm. willing to use America's leverage, as mm -hmm. opposed to a president who may love the state of Israel, but was unwilling to utilize that power. And There's a little bit of the, uh, you always hurt the one you love, uh, as the old country song goes, and maybe a little bit less love and more respect or more exercise of regional power would have been, uh, you know, very much more in our interests. And I, what's, looking back again, I see the fantasy element, mm -hmm. uh, even more than the faith, has become really prevalent. And um, I probably would have said back in 2007, 2008, 2009, that, that fantasy really was the, the, the dominant force in America's involvement in the Middle East, but it really has come to dominate. I saw it during the Obama years, the fantasy that if America intervened in Libya, Libya would become a unified democratic pro-Western mm -hmm. power. Um, same thing true with ISIS fighting in Iraq and Syria, Afghanistan. One of you remember Obama had called Afghanistan the good war. Um, so much for that. Um, the belief that uh, if you overthrew Mubarak in 24 hours, you would have uh, liberal democracy in Egypt. I, I could go on and on. Yemen, Tunisia, yes. I go on and on. There's, there's an event that sticks in my mind. I don't know why it sticks in my mind. It's actually, I don't think it's in the, the ally book, but I was invited to an iftar at the White House. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, the, I will have to for second uh, for, for, for uh, Ramadan. And um, it was actually a, a practice that was instituted by George Bush, not by Obama. Right. And, uh, and later on, I, I held the iftar at the, at the Israeli embassy. You had three of them at, at your residence, right? Yes. And that, that I, is one of, I, I, friendly enough, I think it's one of my proudest achievements. I, I'm proudest of it. And when uh, Ron Dermer took over for me um, at the end of, at the beginning of 2014, I asked him to do one thing, and that was to continue the iftar. Mm -hmm. And he has. He has, and all these really ambassadors can do the iftar. It's, 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 it's lovely, it really is. And there's actually a waiting line to get into it, you'd be surprised. But that's not the story. The story was that I was at the iftar at the White House. And um, it was very funny. If we're of a certain generation during weddings and bar mitzvahs when we were kids, you'd have the, the non-Jewish table. <laughs> at, at the iftar of the White House, I was at the Jewish table. All yeah. the Jews were at this table, right? right, right, right. right? Was, <laughs> yeah, Shapiro, David Axelrod, a couple of people all at this table. And, um, and the president got up and, and, and called a 15-year-old uh, American Muslim girl to the podium, and she was wearing a hijab. And he was, pro he, was, he was praising her 
for winning a case, a civil rights case that enabled her to wear a hijab to a public school. And he, and he praised the fight for the right of women to wear a hijab. And I, I don't know who I turned to, whether it was Dan or David, and I said, that's very interesting, but the real issue in the Middle East is not who has the right to wear a hijab, but who has the right not to wear it. And here we see what's happening in, in Iran right now. And what's you that see. about? It's about the right not to wear a hijab. Mm -hmm. And you know, <clears throat> that administration, and I want to be as delicate as I can about this, got not just one thing, but got everything all wrong. Right. It got, you know, certainly got Libya, Egypt, Syria, Iraq. Uh, Afghanistan, Yemen, everything wrong. And then that administration came to us and said, well, we're going to get this one thing, which is existential for the state of Israel, the Iran nuclear deal. We're going to get that one right. And trust us. Um, you know, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about the, the, uh, the idea of fantasy. You know, I was thinking, and the book talks about, you know, the Rudolf Valentino idea of fantasy. Yeah. Romantic Bedouin and yeah, and yet when you say fantasy, what you really mean is uh, a solipsistic, you know, uh, idea that the world was made in our image, and we have a fantasy that we can project what we want uh, and what we think should be on everyone else. And as you say, it was a universal non. Uh, performing uh, idea. It was a failure everywhere. Uh, and, and a lot of what I want to talk about with you <clears throat> is that continuing relevance. Uh, and it's funny, I think you cribbed my notes because I said, you know, you look at the Goldstone Report, you look at the Mavi Marmara incident, which was so important at the time. And today it was like, what? Who? Really? You know, it's like ancient, literal, literally almost ancient history. But this idea of this mindset, both with the Palestinian peace process, both with the Iranian nuclear deal, is front and center. And we are, uh, unfortunately, as you say, I think we're, we're reifying and reiterating uh, past, uh, the, we're seeing past failures play out again. This is, it, it's interesting. This is this is a, a characteristic which is hardwired into the American consciousness and certainly in American foreign policy going back not 10 years, but but 200 years. And that's yeah. the tendency of Americans to look at the world in the Middle East in particular as a mirror, but it's a cracked mirror. <laughs> and the American goal is to fix the crack in the mirror and get the United States to look like the United States in the Middle East and to find the George Washington in the Middle East. And, you know, I saw this, you know, up front here, I got an opportunity to write about it, but then I saw it. Uh, for five years, we had uh, very high-level, um, intimate talks uh, with our American counterparts about the Iranian nuclear program. And we saw the exact same intelligence stuff. We reached the same conclusions about the, uh, the intelligence, how many facilities the Iranians had, how much enriched uranium, to what degree did they have. We, we, we saw it all. Uh, where we differed was over this way of looking at the Middle East. And, and we would say, listen, Iran wants to make a, a nuclear bomb. These guys want the bomb. And they're going to wait for a certain event in the world, a tsunami somewhere, and they're going to break out and make one. And our American counterparts came, no. Um, they said they don't want a bomb. We believe that if Iran is treated with, treated with respect and uh, economically incentivized, that it, Iran can become, quote unquote, a responsible regional power. And, you know, we scratched our heads. So, of course, when Iran gets the, the nuclear deal in 2015 and gets hundreds of billions of dollars, they don't build hospitals and schools. Uh, they invest that money in terror. They invest that money in spreading Iranian influence throughout the Middle East, what is called euphemistically as Iran's malign behavior. I almost want to laugh at that. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in, uh, I think it's called war crimes. And, um, <laughs> and it, But I think, they, I think our, our American friends actually believe this. They, they actually believe that you know, if Mubarak was going to go, there was going to be democracy in Libya. And our intelligence generals would call me in Washington and say, my mishtagu, what are they, crazy? Are they crazy? Do they understand what Egypt is? Um, and I don't think they could they could see see by it. I right. was in um, <laughs> I happened to be in the White House the day that that Mubarak was overthrown and uh, stepped down overthrown. And all the people on the you know the NSA and White House staff were were high fine one another. Yeah, that was a great yeah, you achievement. mentioned that in the book. Yeah, and then you know I was there a year later <laughs> when Morsi was overthrown, his, his Muslim brotherhood, okay, and they were not high fying anymore. No, no. 
Um, you know, it's interesting. As we speak, we are looking at this uh, Lebanon gas deal, right? So Israel accepts, accepts the deal and the <laughs> response is, what deal? You know, what are you talking about? We would never accept, you know, and, and this is the Middle East. And, and it seems like the Americans never understand the shuk mentality. They never understand how it really works here because it's profoundly different from uh, how it works. Let, let's take the two state solution now that we're on to it. Okay. So I, I have a, a rather unique, maybe unfortunate perspective. I was an advisor to Yitzhak Rabin and I have been involved in every peace plan going back to 1993. I was an advisor to the Trump peace plan. Which, by the way, is probably the best peace plan we've ever had, and that and even the Palestinians even had, but they rejected it. And um, you know, here this is a policy which has systematically, consistently failed uh, for 30 years. And if you look at it objectively, you say two-state solution. Wait a minute, who are you going to make it with? There's no Palestinian leadership. You know, Mahmoud Abbas is in the 17th year of his his four-year term. Uh, he has no authority. He has no plenipotentiary ability. The Palestinians are incapable of sustaining even a mini state in Gaza with one leadership. Um, Israel is not going to, we're not going to pluck up hundreds of thousands of Israeli citizens from their homes in Judea and Samaria. We're not going to redivide Jerusalem. I mean, if you, if you look at it, even in, in the slightest objective fashion, you know that the two state solution is, in fact, an oxymoron. You can right. manage the situation by that, but, but that is not. Stop. Successive administrations, and now more recently Democratic administrations, but George Bush signed on to this too, from committing to a, a policy which has absolutely no chance of success. That's absolutely no one. And, and, and at the expense of other policies which could succeed, which could succeed. And yeah. um, that's extraordinary. That's extraordinary and very tragic. Uh, tragic, first of all, for the Palestinians. Yes. Um, well, you know, one of the things that you did very, I thought, very adeptly in the book, and probably comes from your experience as a historian, was to provide color and detail into the into the uh, personalities of the of the primary players. I'm referring to, of course, Obama and and Bibi Netanyahu. In terms of looking at them uh, as personalities and what makes them tick, and and you were very, I thought, very analytical about. Obama, you talked about him as being sort of a bloodless ideologue, not a people person, very smart guy, uh, something of a control freak. Uh, and as you look back, is that, do you think that assessment was accurate? And do you think that that assessment continued to motivate him throughout uh, his presidency? Yes, and I want to say at the outset, I had great admiration for Barack Obama. Um, uh, he's, he is an he is an exceptional individual. He just is, and uh, and given his story, which is quite a quite a unique story, uh, it's an amazing it's an amazing uh, narrative, it's an amazing journey he went on to from you know from Hawaii to the White House. Um, having said that, I I think I understood him fairly well. I was able to predict with with almost complete accuracy the positions he was going to take because I knew many of his outlooks from university. I spent years on campuses in the United States, mm -hmm. and. Um, and some of the same campuses he studied, and uh, and so they were not they were not a new, they were not they were not surprising to me, not shocking, um, and um, and yes, he was I think a, a rather ruthless politician. You don't get to the White House by being nice usually. Um, he was brutal with Bibi, Bibi just brutal, and I think gratuitously brutal, brutal uh, unnecessarily, um, and and I think it backfired. As a politician. Why do you think that was? Why do you think he felt the need to be brutal? Well, I was actually sitting with two uh, Washingtonian insiders uh, just before the inauguration, and uh, they turned to me and said, "You know that Obama. The first thing he does when he gets into office is going to pick a fight with Israel. He's going to create a crisis with Israel." And I was, I was you know, struck by this. I wasn't ambassador yet. I was, I was a visiting professor at Georgetown. I said, "Why would he do that?" Well, he has to distinguish himself from from George Bush. He has to distinguish himself even from Clinton. Uh, he wants to normalize the, Amer the American-Israel relationship, which is a special relationship. He wants to take on APAC and hates APAC. Uh, there are people around him who hated APAC, like Rob Emanuel, um, and he would pick a fight. And one of the first things he did in office was pick a fight. Just pick it. And, um, and then treated Netanyahu 
in the words of Jackson Deal, the Washington Post uh, columnist, who I greatly, greatly respect, he treated him as worse than, than a third world dictator, you know, mm -hmm. having him come to the back entries of the White House. It was just, you know, gratuitously, gratuitously uh, disrespectful. Now, you know, uh, Netanyahu, as, as even Netanyahu would say, none of us have a monopoly uh, over, you know, over fault, over mistakes. And uh, we made our mistakes too. We made our mistakes too. And uh, I think there was a personal, it isn't the, the difference in the world view. You couldn't find two more, um, uh, more ir irreconcilable uh, worldviews than those of Netanyahu and Obama. Um, Netanyahu came into office as one of the most experienced statesmen and, 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 and politicians in the world. All right, there's a guy, you know, now you just graduate from MIT and been a commander in Sarek Makal and had uh, been ambassador to the UN, had been uh, the assistant ambassador in Washington. He had held every position uh, in Israeli leadership, you know, foreign minister, finance minister. He himself was a master economist um, and prime minister already now in his, his second term. We're now talking about 2009. Uh, that's very intimidating for someone like Barack Obama, who had been really in politics maybe two or three years had never served in the military. Um, you know, they would say, some of the people would say he never held a, really held a real job. He was a community organizer, part-time law professor. Um, you don't want to face Netanyahu, maybe Netanyahu, you don't know. That can be very intimidating um, to people. And uh, you know, he has a, uh, Netanyahu has a very forceful personality. Yeah. yeah, you made the point that you said, you didn't think that Obama was anti-Israel, but that he loved the Israel what I would call the pre-67. He loved the tenuous, vulnerable, you know, the, the Israel of the Tembel and the kibbutz guy. He, he, loved, he loved the Israel of, of Golda Meir and Marsha Diane, but you know, that is fantasy too though. You know? Yes, that's my point. That's what that, that's fantasy. Right? Moshe Dayan, the, the robber of archaeology, archaeological sites, and and you know, and uh, <laughs> and, and, and the donator <laughs> of our most holy site. I mean, really, I mean, to... I mean, really, really, really. Golda Meir, the person, you know, the prime minister who's not revered by Israelis because she she bears responsibility for two thousand six hundred Israeli soldiers, you know, killed in the Yom Kippur War. Uh, that was a fantasy, the fantasy of Israel. He wasn't really to 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 look at the, the reality of Israel. And I think it's true of much of liberal America, not really to respect the democratic choices of the Israeli electorate. Um, you know, they would ask, the Americans always ask us, oh, respect Morsi in Egypt, he's been elected. Or respect uh, Mahmoud Abbas, he's been elected. But they didn't respect our elected leaders, yeah. even though it's a real democracy here. Uh, and uh, and that, was, that was very disturbing. Yeah, you make, it, you make a fascinating point, and that is, the, the dis or we need to make a distinction between a guy who comes into office and, and needs to pick a fight, right? And, but why this fight? Because if this is the unshakable, unbreakable, uh, you know, no daylight uh, relationship, one that was cherished, that precisely because it was that relationship that it needed to be, taken down a notch or it had to be viewed a different way or or aren't there some things you just take as a given in life like you don't abuse your grandmother you know it's just like that's it's just uh, a given i think uh, president obama came into office and he wanted to you know turn a new page in america's relationship with the with the muslim world um you know he six months into his presidency barely uh, he went to cairo and gave a speech that was three times as long as his first inaugural address uh, and in many ways changed America's relationship with the Muslim world fundamentally in ways that uh, you know we had no form we had no forewarning of uh, in in violation of a long-standing American Israel policy understanding that we would always have the ability to look at presidential speeches that impacted our security we'd have a chance to look at them in advance we got no advance warning uh, mm -hmm. from the Cairo speech um, and changed many things. Um, so yeah, there was also that, and he thought that the, the, the special U.S.'s relationship was somehow incompatible uh, with a strong relationship between the United States and the Muslim world. It turned out to be untrue. In fact, just the opposite was true, that uh, as one Palestinian leader told me in secret, oh, we don't like Barack Obama. I said, why well, do not like Barack Obama? He's the most pro-Palestinian president in history. He says, we don't like people who betray their friends. Right. And Is that was Barack that great. Is Barack Obama the inadvertent father of the Abraham Accords? Yes, definitely. 
Unequivocally, yes. Because uh, Obama set out to bring Jews and Arabs uh, closer together through peace, and he succeeded, just not through peace. He succeeded through com our common opposition to his policies, particularly toward Iran. He brought us together. And, uh, you know, it's a great accomplishment. Uh, it was inadvertent, but an accomplishment nevertheless. Right. What do you think, knowing him and knowing his orientation, he would think of the Abraham? I mean, we know that the Biden administration is not too wild about the Abraham. I think he would be um, very lukewarm toward it. First of all, he would see it as coming at the, at the expense of the Palestinian issue. And um, I mean, in fact, the Abraham Accords totally overturned all the assumptions about, you know, Arab Israeli peacemaking. And these assumptions had been uh, regnant for almost a half century. They were um, deeply ingrained in what I call the peace establishment, which is all those think tanks and the media and the universities, which said that, you know, first of all, before you have peace between Israel and the Arab world, you have to have peace with Israel and the Palestinians. And that can only be based on uh, Israeli territorial concessions, withdrawal to the 67 lines, redivision of Jerusalem, uprooting, you know, Israeli quote unquote settlers, um, all of that. It completely, completely uprooted it. It even uprooted the notion that when you make peace between Israel and an Arab state, first you have peace and then you have normalization. Uh, that was the that was the Jordan Egypt paradigm. But the Abraham, of course, just the opposite. We have normalization, then we got peace. So <laughs> you're talking about a huge, vast establishment that uh, was completely uh, defrocked by these uh, by these accords. So, so you leave Washington in 2013, yeah. and in 2016, Obama leaves Washington, and in comes a guy who, until you know, six months prior, no one in, would have thought would be the next president of the United States, Donald Except for Trump. Me. <laughs> I got. I have, I have a good political gut. And I remember telling okay. you the, uh, the, uh, in March of 2016, I remember walking into a meeting of the Republican Jewish Coalition. I said, gentlemen, guess what? Your next president is Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, and they were shocked. They were shocked. Uh, their, their jaws fell open. You said, they're, yeah. they're crazy, they said. Okay. Well, what, what may have been even more shocking to a lot of Washingtonians was not just getting Trump, but getting Jared Kushner and David Friedman and, Jer and you know, Jason Greenblatt. Greenblatt. Uh, and and here, you know, I, I found myself, first of all, I'm reading the book and I said, this thing reads like a Greek tragedy. Like, you know, we're going from one preordained problem to another. It's just a question of time before things fall apart. Just a question of time. And I love the way, you, you know, you have your stomach, your, your heart and your stomach every time BB's together with Obama, you know, and they walk out. Is it going to be frowns, scowls? Are they going to be you know, friends, and, and it's like, it's like living through an abusive marriage, you know, it's like, how do you know how this thing is going to go from one hour to the next, but it seems like the recurring theme is nothing good is going to happen, and then it ends, and then this guy comes in, uh, Trump, and he brings in people who, you know, turn everything over on its ear. Uh, in terms of the assumption, you know, the famous no, 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 no of John Kerry, like you can't possibly make, you know, that, that uh, make peace in the Middle East until you, it, you make peace with the Palestinians. Uh, and Trump does, you know, amazing things, moving the embassy, recognizing Israel, uh, Jerusalem as Israel's capital, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing sovereignty in the Golan, uh, recognizing that the settlements are not per se illegal. Uh, and and I'm, as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking to myself, does Michael really like wish he had the opportunity to be the <laughs> ambassador like, you know, five no. years later? No, he wouldn't have no. had as much fun probably. <laughs> no, I was there to serve. And I felt like I served during a difficult time. And uh you know, it's it's uh, not to make a bad comparison. It's a difference between a, uh, a wartime and a peacetime soldier. And, uh, and, you know, it's very good to be a peacetime soldier, but sometimes you need to be a warrior too. And uh, and I felt that, you know, that that was the battle of the day. And, uh, you know, again, no monopoly over mistakes. 
them. We made them, they made them. Uh, at the end of the day, it was a very, uh, and I'm speaking as an historian now, with the possible exception of, of a short period of the Eisenhower years in the 50s, this was the hardest episode, the most mm. fraught chapter in the, in, in the history of U.S. relations. Yeah. And now, now let's, we're, we're in the, the Biden administration. Many of us here think this is, as, at least as concerns U.S.-Israeli relationships, is Obama's third term in the sense that you have a lot of the same players, you seem to have a lot of the same body language, same issues. Is that a fair statement? Am I uh, overstating that? It, it, over, it is an overstatement. Um, and it's important to, to stress the differences. First of all, I, I, Joe Biden did a very, very well. Um, he was in many ways my point of contact with the, with the Obama administration. It wasn't well known, but Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, uh, boycotted the Israeli embassy. I wouldn't return my phone calls. I think I mentioned this in the book. Yes. But Biden never lived along with that. Biden loved Israel. He was deeply beholden to the Jews who, who really pushed him for and supported him throughout his political career. He had great Rosh Hashanah parties. Uh, mm -hmm. And I had a very open, frank relationship. And I could always reach him. Or I could always reach his, his uh, chief of staff of foreign affairs, a gentleman by the name of Tony Blinken. Yeah, uh, I've heard of him. You heard yeah. of him. And, uh, and I had a very close relationship with, J with Jake Sullivan as well. Um, and so I know these people well. They are deeply committed to the U.S.'s relationship to, to security. They're not. That, that's not just. That's not just rhetoric. Mm -hmm. They are, however, Democrats, which means they're going to support the two-state solution. What they're actually going to do about it is probably minimal because they know mm -hmm. they're not going to be John Kerry here wasting you know two years running back and forth. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. If the Palestinians didn't negotiate, didn't come to the negotiating over the table under the Obama administration, they're never coming. They're never coming, and they're not coming. Um, and on the Iran issue, too, I think it's with a certain reluctance um, that they pursued a renewed Iranian uh, nuclear deal. Right now, it seems to be moribund. I don't know for how much longer. Um, but they, they, there's, there's a definite difference. These, these are not the same people who are around the Obama administration, though many, yes, there are many people, secondly, in the second echelon, uh, are very much Obama people. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but there's limit. They have other things on their mind. There's an issue called China. There's an issue called Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, you know, uh, tremendous divide, very di divisions and, and, and schisms in American society. There's other things uh, on their minds, and as they mm -hmm. should be, they should be definitely. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to be cognizant that they are answerable to a Democratic Party. It's interesting as we're approaching the midterm elections in November, uh, some of the rhetoric. Uh, about settlements, about open fire orders of the Israeli army and the way in Judea and Samaria, they, they've ratcheted up a bit. And I think I see that as an attempt to sort of placate the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, which is highly critical of the administration for not doing enough on the Palestinian issue. Mm -hmm. By the way, why do you think a Hillary Clinton in the embassy? I think that was a policy, it was Obama's policy. It was a way of taking us down. My predecessors had an open line to the Secretary of State. And they were shocked to hear that I couldn't make a telephone call to Hillary Clinton. Shocked. And uh, I mean, later she, she, she ended the boycott. She ended it because she realized mm -hmm. it was counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And she also boycotted our, our, our foreign minister, uh, mm -hmm. Andrew Lieberman, just simply boycotted him. And it's, it's, not, it's not good diplomacy to boycott, you know, it's not good, but it's certainly not an ally. You don't mm -hmm. want to do that. Um, right. right. Is that a difference between the two administrations that? that Obama wasn't as interested or needed to be as interested in placating the progressive wing. Uh, Biden seems to have thrown his lot in completely with the progressive wing. Well, this is now ancient history, right? 10, 12 years ago, the progressive wing was small right. and not very vocal and very frightened of Barack Obama. Today, the progressive wing is probably almost dominant in the Democratic Party and is not afraid of Joe Biden at all. And uh, very big difference, big difference. Um, um, it's interesting. I, I, I think in the book, I tell a story about my last day on the job. It just happens to be a day that Nitsi now is visiting Washington and we're in the Oval Office. And Obama said something that, is, that stuck with me then and stuck with me ever since. He said, you know, if Israel ever gets itself into a war, of course America is going to help it uh, because that is what the American people expect. It's not what I would do. <laughs> I would feel compelled to do. No, it's because that's what the American people would expect. Yes, I, so I remember that. Right. And I just, I, want, I, I, I don't know what the American people would expect today. 
Um, Isn't that leading from behind? Isn't that? Uh... No, it's just he didn't feel that he didn't feel that that moral compulsion. I came back in 2014 and I met with Israel's security leadership and I said, uh, you know, folks, I got some tough words for you. And that is, we're on our own. You know, I was uh, in my deep history. I was in Beirut in 1982 with the with the paratroopers and. Um, you know, the, I, in those days, we knew if, if Israel got itself into a, a quagmire that, that the president of the United States would come and, and get us out. You know, Reagan sent the Marines mm -hmm. and did that. Marines aren't coming anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not. And that was, I said this now, what, eight, nine years ago. Um, and now I think it, back then it was very shocking for people to hear. Um, and today I think it's, it's understood that this is not. I don't think there's any expectation today. Though. No, no expectation. The flip side of that, and I would tell Netanyahu this, and he would always look kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> nonplussed when I said it. I said, you owe uh, Barack Obama a big, a big uh, note of thanks. And he'd say, why? I said, well, he, he threw us out of the nest. Mm -hmm. uh, we were so secure in the U.S.'s relationship that we didn't bother developing t strong ties with Asia or South America or Africa. He right. threw us out of the nest. And so today, our foreign policy portfolio is much more diversified than it was uh, at yes. the beginning of the century, much more. Yes. And um, I want to just take a, a, a little bit of a different tack before we finish uh, from the book. You, you, you're, the book is remarkably candid in being autobiographical. I must say that I thought that the, your very uh, candid assessment of yourself in terms of your learning challenges, your physical challenges as a, as a kid uh, were very, very poignant. And it, and it uh, you know, you were very upfront about talking about how for yourself and for your kids, and I would say for one of my kids as well, that the having learning issues forced you to work much harder, forced you to uh, really grapple with stuff that uh, and and propelled you into levels of success and achievement that you might not have had if you weren't beset with those challenges. And I thought I, I just I just want to say that I thought that that was extremely poignant and and, and very touching. Um, the other thing that I I would just comment on from the book, uh, you you like I are a uh, product of Columbia. And while I know I look 20 years younger than you, I'm actually, I was five years ahead of you there. Really? Uh, and then, yeah. Uh, and then you went on to uh, Princeton. And you talked about something that to me was jaw dropping. Here you are in the early 80s. You're talking about widespread campus anti Zionism on the Princeton campus in the early 80s, 40 years ago. We, we seem to have this idea that. Uh, rampant campus anti-Zionism in America is a relatively recent phenomenon. Right. And yet you are living proof of something very different. I'd like you to just give us a sense of what, what you were experiencing way back when. Oh, I have people who wouldn't talk to me, professors um, who were uh, very, you know, very rough with me uh, because of this. And I, I, I was in the unique position of studying Lebanon at, at Princeton after I just fought in Lebanon. And uh, and uh, I was accused, you know, in, in not so uncertain terms of being a, a child killer and a whatever a war criminal. Um, it was a, it was sharp departure from what I experienced in the nineteen seventies because there was very little uh, politics of that nature uh, in the nineteen seventies. Um, I should plug Columbia. David Freeman was in John Jay Hall with me. Uh, <laughs> you can't make all this stuff up. Yeah, uh, Dory, Dory Gold was my classmate. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. We, we all we came, we, we got involved in Israel one way or the other. Um, we should say a word. We should say a word about Israel and Zionism, shall we? Sure. Uh, um, I've uh, spent almost my entire life involvement in this country, uh, serving this country, living in this country, raising a family in this country. Best decision I ever made. Um, and, and Zionism itself is, is under, even the name, the word is under assault. The word. So, um, I view the creation of the state of Israel and the survival of the state of Israel as the, the greatest single privilege we can have to be Jews alive at this time. We should be thankful every single day, even for our problems. We should say, 
for all of our crises, all of our wars, all of our expensive livings, we have a sovereign, independent, strong, creative, vibrant Jewish state in the, in the land of our ancestors. I mean, think about that. In, in Amen, can, can you know, some, Michael, I, I, you know, you're giving a plug to uh, Imtir Tzu, which is Israel's largest grassroots Zionist organization, which lives and breathes the idea that the, the Zionist mission is so worthy of being nurtured and protected and strengthened. Uh, and uh, our, our dual prong mission of uh, Oset Tov and Sur Mara is, is you know, you, you enhance and you protect and you also defend and you fight when other people want to demonize and denigrate and delegitimize the country. Uh, and those of us who made Aliyah, I, look, my wife and I never had a second thought about going back or that we made a mistake. Uh, and it's not that we haven't had a myriad of challenges here, but this is an extraordinarily special place. Uh, and uh, your books really contribute to that. Your, your, your insight uh, contributes to that. Now look, you come back from being ambassador, you go right into politics. You know, you didn't take the five-week vacation that Rahm Emanuel suggested that you take. You <laughs> got sucked up. Looking forward to it now, country. by the way, Doug. I'm, I'm waiting for it right now. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and, and maybe we'll end with this, but, you know, it was fascinating to me that here you are, you are in the epicenter of the old establishment. You are, you know, you're in the White House all the time. You are talking with the movers, makers, people that we read about, you had, you know, direct relationships with them. When it comes time for you to go into politics, even though your boss was head of the crew, you're not part of it. You go into a party that was really focused on very social issues, almost like a populistic party, uh, Kulanu. And uh, so I, I found that a very fascinating that, you know, that you're switching gears in that way. and and was the real Michael Oren the guy <laughs> who, you know, who, who's the real one, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Talk a little bit about it. Yeah, it, it actually wasn't a switch. Um, first of all, it, as part of the, my arrangement with the Glada Party, I was in charge of foreign affairs and I had, uh, I had a free hand. No one else was involved in foreign affairs, so it was, you know, I had a monopoly. Uh, but in terms of social policy, um, if, uh, if the party of Yigal alone was still around today, Ahdut Abuda, which was right of center on strategic and security issues, but left of centers on social issues, that would have been me. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the Kulana was the closest thing I could find to uh, to mm -hmm. I was very much uh, in lockstep uh, mm -hmm. with the policies. I almost had I had very few policy dif disagreements. Some of the disagreements related to is United States is with relations with the United States. I've been a mm -hmm. long. I, if we probably don't have time to discuss this, but I've long been an opponent of the U.S. aid to Israel. And I was the only uh, member of the Israeli government to oppose me, of all people, to oppose it and the, and the terms of which it was given. Um, Is that because it was dependency or uh, this idea of casting away the net is, is a net benefit for us? Or There are many reasons. Um, one of the reasons, for example, one of the, the great significance of the aid was the, the message that the, the great power of the United States stood behind the state of Israel. But if America is not willing to project that power, then the aid is worth a lot less. Uh, it's also a much smaller portion of our portion of our, yeah. of our budget than it used to be. It enables people like you know Elizabeth Warren uh, to get up there and say, "Well, we should cut aid to Israel." They enable them to 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 arm twist us and give the impression that they can arm twist us. And I don't think that a country this strong today uh, can afford to broadcast that type of vulnerability, particularly in our neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. There are many other reasons, opportunity yeah. costs. Um, I would like to see that aid transformed in some type of cooperative investment uh, in cybersecurity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in laser technologies, uh, rather than sort of just here, we're giving you money. And well, it's really a backdoor uh, way of subsidizing the American it's defense industry. It's total subsidy for the American defense industry. And by the way, countries like Germany, uh, South Korea, Japan, and now Ukraine get vastly more of the state of Israel. Yes, of course. Because it's not include, it's not it's not it's not an aid package. It's part of the Pentagon budget, right. and which also it, it makes us it, it it renders us vulnerable that it's an aid package. Yes, 
And I don't think Israel needs American aid. What we need is, what we need is America collaboration on issues of, of mutual uh, defense uh, interest to, 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 to these countries. Uh, I think. That sense growing in America that America, that Israel has America's back, you know, that we are actually a, a, a real asset for America in terms of our intelligence, in terms of cyber, in terms of things that we can provide to the United States or, or no. I think objectively that's true. Um, I don't know the degree to which that actually percolates through American popular consciousness. I, I don't. Um, and it, it, it's important for us to remind Americans of that. And it's important, but more, most importantly for Americans to remind Americans of that. Yeah. That there really is no intelligence relationship, bilateral intelligence relationship like uh, the U.S.'s relationship and that we are, are very essential for American security. Um, and you know, that's a case that should be made not just by us, it has to be made by others in the United States, um, not necessarily by American Jews. It'd be very good. Yes, no. Uh, by the way, that, uh, I don't know if you read it, but uh, Walter Russell Mead just came out with the book, Art of a Covenant. And the basic premise of the book is a lot of what people think is the Israel lobby or APEC has nothing to do with Jews. Sure. American policy has really, and, and I thought of power, faith, and fantasy when I was reading his book, that it really is not necessarily, you know, we, we're a little bit too uh, self-referential. Uh, uh, Walter's, Walter's a great friend. If you look on the back of the book, you'll see that I blurred the book. I, I, I read several versions of this book as it was being written. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and we go way back, uh, Walter and I, we both... Uh, uh, we both taught at Yale. We were in the same program together. We go, we, we go way back. He's a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful scholar and a great lover of Israel. Uh, yeah. And a very brave individual. It takes guts to write a book like that. Yes, I thought it was terrific. So, um, Michael, just in closing, update us. What are you doing these days? So, I, um, um, as they say in, in, uh, in the Talmud, you, you, there's no Torah without Kemach. Uh, for for right. Kemach, I, I represent uh, high tech companies. I, I love Israeli high tech. It's just that's fascinating, and it, it is a it is a way of advancing Israel's interests both economically and, and strategically around the world by by promoting Israeli high tech, and I enjoy that greatly. Um, I, uh, I we didn't really touch on this, but I have another hat. I've been a, a novelist and an author for many many years. Uh, I've just now published my fifth work of fiction. Uh, it's called, I have a show. I'm gonna plug it. It's called Please. Uh, well, Swan's, Swan's War, War, ladies and gentlemen. It, 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 it's a it's a who done it. It's a page turning who done it. And so far, the, the reviews have been great. And I'm going on a very long book tour in a couple of a uh, couple of weeks around the United States because it's also Jewish Book Month in the United States. But I also have uh, several uh, projects. I just signed a contract with Netflix for a, uh, for a uh, multi episode uh, series. We'll see if it gets made or not. They signed a lot of these contracts, but it's very nice. Um, and uh, and I am. I am now, I will soon embark on writing what I hope to be the definitive work, but the, you said the 1967 book was the definitive work about that war. I'm trying to write the definitive work about Israel's war of independence. And uh, that's a big challenge for me, not just uh, not just uh, sort of methodologically and intellectually, but it's a challenge, it's also financially. You mentioned that for many years, I was a, a fellow at the Shalem Center. The Shalem Center is now the Shalem College and uh, does not support uh, historical research. Today, there actually is no institute that supports historical research about Israel. And my books are you know, four-year projects that have a yeah. budget. And uh, so I straight up, I have to go out you know, and, and raise money for this book. Yeah. And I'm engaged with that uh, right now. And I hope to start writing in a couple of uh, months. I have a contract from Random House to publish that book. Terrific, terrific. Well, we're rooting for you, of course. Michael, this was really terrific. It was fascinating. Uh, you have so much insight to share with us. And, uh, and above all, you have so much more to contribute going forward to this amazing country uh, that inspires both of us and, and I think inspires millions who are here and around the world. So I want to thank you. I want to wish you uh, a wonderful super. And um, I spared uh, everyone uh, the view of my designer sukkah <laughs> on our uh, porch, but uh, it's a great time of year. It's a great time to be here in Jerusalem, uh, in, Su in Sukkot, uh, and to be in Israel. Keep keep slugging, Michael. Keep keep, slugging. keep, uh, keep us wise. 
keep us informed. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Bye now.